Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. You know, when I think back about uh, how this cold air event really got set up, you know, meteorologically, yeah, there was a ridge that built in here, another ridge in, in, that built over for Greenland, and that just squeezed the cold air that was out of the Arctic down. It was helped along by the by the anchoring of the polar vortex, basically between, you know, this part of the Canadian archipelago and Greenland and, and the Hudson Bay. And it just opened up the doorway to just send that cold air funneling it right down there against the Rocky Mountains, making it clear uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. And we're still dealing with it, of course, right now. But when we just think back about the synoptic setup to this and then the impact of this, there's going to be several things that I'll remember. And one will be the ice, the repeated ice storms that stretch from Texas all the way to the Mid-Atlantic and in parts of the Northeast. But this video you're watching here, uh, this was shared last night by the Duck Girl. That's what she goes by here uh, in Louisiana, just out showing you some of the uh, ice that was on the Spanish moss here on these cypress trees. Just incredible to see this. We'll also think back to the impacts this had on parts of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, just to get started here with the um, with a number of power outages. This is kind of the, the latest update here. And you can check out this website. It's just poweroutage.us. Um, uh, and uh, we still had, you know, Texas was still over a million uh, without power. You can also see parts of the Ohio River Valley and then back in Oregon. I mean, can't forget the, the ice storms that have hit part of Oregon in the last uh, several days as well. But put it all together with snow, uh, this is what I've got for the last six days. So we start from the west to east, big snows in the Cascade Mountains. We're going to talk about those more in a few moments, also in the Blue Mountains here too. But remember, the flow did, for the most part, avoid California, especially the, the southern half. So we did put some in the Sierra Nevada, but not too much. Big snows just last night in, in parts of the Front Range here in Colorado. But you can see how far to the south this got. Now remember, when you look at my color bar, I go to the blues with four inches. So you can see this swath right in through here uh, of heaviest snow and uh, we're going to add a lot to this this was only through 6 p.m last night and this particular area added quite a bit in the overnight hours and you could just paint a stripe to the south of all of this where that ice was and we're going to continue to see the issues with ice today uh, spreading out of mississippi you know heading eventually over to parts of the um, uh, mid-atlantic near the appalachian mountains and, and then into north carolina now, I thought of another way to show you about this. One of my favorite websites, you got to go to this. If you just Google MRCC or go to this link, Midwest Regional Climate Center, and look up their severe weather uh, uh, winter index, you get this beautiful map of all these stations where they've been collecting data uh, and they've defined an index based on temperature, precipitation, all sorts of things here that tells you whether or not you're having an extreme winter or all the way to a mild winter. And I thought it'd be neat to just do a very quick tour of the country. I'm going to start in San Antonio. So when you look at these graphics on each one of them, you're going to have a top bound here and a lower bound. And you can see the color coding corresponds to mild to extreme. And in San Antonio, Texas, right here, they were having a winter that was sitting right here until this massive cold air event hit. And now they're way up here in the extreme category. If you go a bit farther uh, to the north, let's check out Des Moines right in this area. Uh, we had been having a pretty average winter until we broke here in, at the end of January into February up into the severe and extreme category of some of those big snowfall events and then the cold we're dealing with now. Uh, Glasgow, right up here, okay? This winter started off with a bang. Remember this back in October? Big snowstorms, brutally cold air, and then it just it got mild and not a lot of snow. And the bump up that you see here right at the very end, this was primarily due to the cold air, not the snow. Just looking here through February 17th, you can see a large area in the northern plains getting back into Montana that still uh, is into a major snow drought. And that's why some of the early spring flood um, concerns on the headwaters of the Missouri or the Mississippi at this point are, are not, not overly concerned because of the lack of snowpack in this area. And it does extend into parts of southern Canada. You can see it right here as well. So this is a region that endured all of that cold air without um, snow on the ground. And uh, just amazing to see this. This is a snow depth map that was valid through uh, midnight uh, this uh, uh, yesterday. From here, let's just start going east. Little Rock, Arkansas, massive jump up here. And of course, we saw big time snows yesterday and to the south of it, a lot of ice. And if I just keep moving, I want to show you Memphis, Tennessee, just a little bit farther to the east. Look at that huge jump up where I was seeing last night snowfall rates between one and three inches an hour. Uh, and we were also seeing uh, ice again, just a little bit farther to the south. But where we're going to see a lot of change in this is going to be over here. I went to Raleigh last. And you notice that in Raleigh, we were kind of hovering around here on the severe winter index in the, in the mild category. 
But our big concerns there is that we still have a broad sector of the country under winter storm warnings. You can see stretching from eastern Texas, northern Louisiana, still through Arkansas, and all the way here into parts of New Jersey, Pennsylvania. And that cuts through, uh, you know, the, the mid-Atlantic into the Carolinas. Georgia, South Carolina, coastal North Carolina, this is all flood. And we have a tornado watch early this morning uh, down here in this part of Florida and southern Georgia. We still have hard freeze warnings pretty far to the south here. And there is still going to be today some more snow snow right here on the back side of this system as it takes off. But those severe storms, this is just early morning look at some of the lightning. So if you were hearing some thunder here from Alabama to Florida, Georgia, North and South Carolina, uh, it was showing up about three o'clock this morning on the uh, on our Blitzer Tongue website here showing us where we had some lightning strikes. And we're going to watch today, according to the Storm Prediction Center, this region for the best chance at having some severe storms roll through. So certainly an early go of it here in the year for having some strong to severe storms. But let's take a look at some high resolution modeling first. And I wanted to start this at 7 p.m. last night where we could still see where that ice was accumulating in northern Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, but the snow on the northern side of it. As we play this forward, you notice that that system spreads through parts of the Tennessee Valley into, you know, the Appalachian Mountains by early this morning. And we're going to watch this morning for this whole region here to be getting some freezing rain. You can see I can just, there's a large area here where there's some cold air damming. That's where the cold air butts up against the Appalachian Mountains, giving you that temperature inversion situation that gives you uh, the chance for ice. So through the morning hours, let's get all the way out to 10 a.m. This is 11 a.m. East Coast time. There'll be some light snow on the back side of this in the Ohio River Valley, some snow spreading Pennsylvania into the north, but that corridor right in through here is why I'm most concerned about ice. You can see the storms on the back side of it here, or the south side of it, excuse me, but notice still in southern Texas, more snow through mid-morning here uh, uh, as the very southern edge of that colder air kind of wraps in just like this. Okay, quickly here, moving on through Thursday afternoon and evening, getting into the overnight hours. We got to still watch this event. You see that the models are still giving us chances for freezing rain. Meanwhile, light snow showers to the north of this, as you can tell here, all the way back into Michigan and Wisconsin. And we do have a front from the tail end of a system that went into British Columbia that is pushing through the Pacific Northwest, uh, bringing in snow once again to the Cascades, kind of jumping over the Columbia Basin here, but heading into the Blue Mountains in the northern Rockies. As we go forward now into the overnight hours on Thursday night into Friday morning, our first system exits, still giving us some snow here in the uh, interior parts of New England, but probably all the way to the coast. And then after that, we go through the weekend or start the weekend with a high pressure cell that begins to slide here first over Kentucky, Tennessee, and then eventually over toward um, North Carolina, bringing warm air back to the midsection of the country for this time of year. Now, from this point forward, I want to show you the same situation, but from the European model. And this is 6 a.m. this morning. And remember, these, these blacks to pinks, I just try to really make a lot of contrast to see where the ice is going to be. The greens rain and the blue would be snow. Let's see where this is going, though. This is by noon today. We see a very similar situation. Let's just go ahead and get to tomorrow morning, tomorrow midday and tomorrow afternoon, Friday afternoon. So then what we notice is that going into the weekend, this is now Saturday getting into Saturday, you know, midday, and then Saturday evening, we see that high pressure cell moving over to the Carolinas, some light snow lingering here in the midsection of the country in the very early morning hours on Sunday. And what we're going to watch is a weak low that's going to go through Sunday afternoon and evening right through Illinois. Now, calling this rain-snow boundary has been quite a challenge for this part of Illinois. It does appear that northern Illinois, Iowa, southern Wisconsin could be getting some more snow out of this. But with that return of the warmer air, it could be right here along I-80 that we have the transition. That could move, but we'll watch it pretty carefully. Well, that low pressure system, as you see here, going into early Monday morning, starts to spread more toward, you know, uh, this part of Ontario out of Michigan, but more rain to the south of it here, as you can see. So what about beyond that? As we work our way through into Tuesday, here we are, Tuesday afternoon, getting into the evening hours and now working our way into Wednesday. We are going to watch another storm system that tries to take shape in Colorado. Uh, this is pretty far out there, but it's sometime around the 25th. This would be a week from now. 
And as this storm system emerges, you see some of the model runs are trying to take it right through you know, this section of the country. I want to tell you, there is almost zero ensemble support for this system. It's not yet set in stone. It seems to be a bit of a rogue system in the model. But whenever you see something like this, this time of year, we got to look out for it. And what I'm also concerned about is by this time, we start to see return of warm, moist, and unstable air on the south side of it, which gets us thinking about the chances for severe storms looking out this far. But I don't want you to get fixated on this as being something that's going to be in the models at the end of next week. We got to watch this one carefully over the weekend to see its evolution. Let's just take a look at a few snapshots here of what we're looking at in terms of ice. This is through Saturday morning. We do still have the ice threat from Mississippi through this part of Alabama, Tennessee, you know, Kentucky, but really getting into the northern part of North Carolina and then Virginia to Maryland. You see that that's the main corridor. We're going to be looking out for some ice. Snowfall, I'm only taking you out five days on this because the second and third systems I showed you, which came through here, weren't well resolved just yet. So we could be getting another two to three inches of snow in this part of Illinois, but that corridor right there on the backside of the first low, possibly four plus inches of snow spreading into the northeast. And remember, we're still not done with it down here in Texas today. Meanwhile, with the lows going into British Columbia, the fronts still hit the Pacific Northwest, adding some snow to the Cascades and the Northern Rockies. How about stretching this out, though? Looking out there the next 10 days, we're looking at the probability of getting three inches of snow, an additional three inches of snow. So take a look at it. What I'm most concerned about is just the lack of storm systems. Sorry, let me draw that in black for you. The lack of systems going through the northern plains, at least through the end of February. There are some indications in the, in the, in the model runs that we're going to stop this storm trajectory where they're coming down like this and maybe start to favor some more storm systems that pop out a little bit farther to the north. Doesn't mean the Ohio River Valley is going to slow down at all, but we got to get these storm systems to come a little bit farther to the north as I drew those arrows there to get more snow on the ground for the northern plains of the United States. But looking at total precipitation, you can see why there are flood watches and warnings out for the southeast. It has been wet there. And as we can see, we may be putting down another two plus inches of rainfall in this corridor right in through here. So let's be on the lookout for some uh, flooding situation in this area. Now, looking out longer term, I stretched this clear out to March the 2nd. And I notice a couple of important things here. We still see split flow in the west. Can you see that? And then it all comes together right here, stretching from Texas through the mid-Atlantic and northeast and then goes off to the, the North Atlantic. This has to break down and change if we're going to return moisture to California, if we're going to change up the precipitation trajectory in parts of the plains. And the a question I'm asking myself is, is that going to happen? Well, you know that with that pattern, with the split, we're still drier than normal, probably through the next 10 plus days, maybe even out to 15 days, with this corridor staying very active. All right. But when I look out there longer term and I ask myself, are we going to see change? such that we can return moisture to this area where we're in drought in the northern plains as well. Because the water year to date map, and this starts back on October 1st, shows us that so much of the West is sitting well below 50% of its normal precipitation. In fact, in California, this is reporting stations in the northern Sierra uh, region right in through here. We're currently at 17 and a half inches on the average. We should be closer to something like 35. When you even slide farther to the south end of the San Joaquin, we're right here at 14.1. We should be at about 25. Okay, that would be average. And then on the Tulare Basin, you look down at these stations, we're at 7.6. We should be approaching about 20. So this just shows you how those numbers, 50% of normal, what they look like. Well, I want to show you an animation. I'm just going to play it for you. This is a one, uh, excuse me, a seven-day sliding window starting on the time period of March th um, uh, 3rd through the 11th and then going through March. Ready? We start to see the jet stream favoring. Look at here in California. We start to see the jet stream favoring better onshore flow, which could return them to more normal precipitation patterns working through March. And this is desperately needed. But if I play that again for you, you continue to see this corridor staying active here through the end of March. And we see drier conditions in the southern plains uh, overall. So 
that's it. I wanted to share with you those weekly, uh, the European weeklies here, just to get an idea about what they're currently saying. And there is some analog support from that, from the MJO, from the La Nina, but that's what the data are currently showing us. Temperatures. Gosh, when I was recording this morning, about 340, they're still cold, but this map, I, I want to show you something. Are you ready? This is how much the temperatures have changed over the last 24 hours. And it's amazing to see that parts of the Midwest here have seen a 10 to 20 plus degree warm up, even though it's still cold for this time of year. Well, how are these temperatures going to transition? Here's your max temperatures on Thursday today. Departures are color coded. As we work our way into Friday, now getting into the weekend, here comes Saturday and Sunday. That cold air slides to the east and watch the rebound post weekend. Ready? Here comes into Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. To get temperatures, high temperatures, back into the 30s and 40s for a big section of the country here, it's going to feel like shorts and t-shirt weather for some folks that have been during temperatures at times that have been 40 degrees colder than normal. And as you look out there day 5 through 10, we continue to see that more moderate pattern showing up, except when you get back into this part of Canada up toward Alaska. Now, one unique thing, uh, difference, I should say, between the GFS on the left and the European on the right is in the Canadian prairie. The models do not agree. This is out to day 10. Look out here at day 10 through 15. You see the European model much, much more relaxed, more downslope flow, more, more warm, mild conditions here, whereas the uh, GFS is just pulling in that colder air. But they all agree on the warmth that's over the southeast, potentially spreading into the Midwest and into the Northeast as well. And thinking about that, this is the forecast right now for the month of March. And we are continuing to see the models favor milder conditions here while trying to keep a lot of the colder air back into the West with that negative PNA pattern. So this is how March is currently looking in the models. There's good analog support for this as well. It's going to depend on that southeast ridge and the deeper troughs that are coming into the Pacific Northwest. So we'll watch it. I'll give you another update on Monday. I appreciate your attention this week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks.